Good afternoon. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, he said a businessman, uh, not actually a businessman. I have been out at sea for 45 years, 25 years as a captain on very large cash ships. But just five years back, we turned into entrepreneur at the age of 62. And that's what I want to tell you a story about the first Indian cruise ship. India has got such a vast coastline and so much of uh, waterways. But we never had a cruise ship of our own. What I call our own is our own flag, Indian flag. So in 2017, we got a Japanese ship, 1,400 passenger ship, converted her into a complete luxury ship in Indian port with all Indian resources. The team which formed this was all technocrats, chief engineers from the ship, captains from the ship. And to add to that, we had naturalists and conservatives. So with this thing, we build up Anvia. Now, we're talking about marine consciousness. The ship has entirely been developed on a basis of Indian history maritime. The ship is named Angria after Kanoji Angre, who was the first admiral of Maratha Navy, <coughs> where India actually started with a defense navy. He entered the battlefield at the age of 13 and never lost a battle. So the ship is inspired by him. We have an excellent his portrait on board and the ship has been decorated and finished with all the forts, maritime forts of India. The cabins are named after the ships Kanoji Angre had and the whole ship has been gifted by naturalists, their photographs, their underwater photographs to showcase what Indian coastline is. So just give me three minutes to show you what Angria is. Can you run the... The link. So we operated this ship for two years. Uh, that is, we commissioned it in 2018. This was inaugurated by Honorable Minister Gadkari Ji and Fadan Vis together. And So we achieved 75% of occupancy within the first two years with 97% of customer satisfaction. That was for a first Indian cruise to achieve 97% of customer satisfaction. So please do Unfortunately, the COVID situation turned the vessel to be uh, laid down for a while. But then uh, it created another thing that we worked more on a social service. Uh, we realized that there are more than four lakh seafarers which were stranded at sea. And they couldn't be reviewed because every country had its own protocol. So we located our vessel at Sri Lanka, the call. And we worked for almost all nationalities, helping them come home and the people join the ship. Uh, also during, during COVID time, uh, also it didn't come into flotation, but uh, the ship was considered to transport 1,200 expats, Indian expats abroad in Gulf and East African countries to be brought to India. This entire exercise was done with external minister, the Minister of External Affairs, Shipping Ministry and Director General of Shipping. Somehow at the last moment we got the aircraft to evacuate them and we did not go into that service. So can I just, uh, we can start the presentation? Yes.
can stop that. So, another thing which I want to mention is the complete crew of the ship was taken up first time in 12. We never took anybody other than the marine. Uh, all the hospitality staff which ran the crews were first time employed and from villages. So, we trained them into marine, we trained them into hospitality and we got them. Uh, this is what we wanted to showcase. But with this, there are a few challenges uh, which I would like to highlight because being a first ship, the case study could be what are the challenges which you face by Indian. One is that Indian water has, doesn't have a significant high wave height more than 2 meters in Arabian Sea or in Bay of Bengal except monsoon. So the legislation which controls certification, design and the criteria should be relaxed as an Indian, as other countries do it. Like Japan has got a relaxed consideration. UK has, European Union has. They have a different consideration for the ships which are operating in their water. If we say that our economic zone goes to 250 kilometers, then up to 2 kilometers, meters, we should have our own legislation which makes the things easier. Whereas the present legislation is very, very heavily laden by colonial and uh, controlled by SOLAS, which is not necessarily a requirement. Secondly, a capital cost. A project like this has gone up to 200 crores. Uh, we put in all our resources, but no bank was ready to come forward to finance. The one other thing is uh, Indian banks are not prepared to finance shipping assets. So like a first-time entrepreneur where we required bank finance, they said you give us 100% collateral security, which is 200 crores of security, not possible. So then we ultimately had to go to non-banking finances where the interest rate is more than 15%. So, any of the ships yeah, actually, they don't finance it. So, there for a long time, there has been a policy and there has been thinking to form a shipping fund where you have a, a designated shipping fund created by the government to finance Indian shipping. Because Indian shipping is going to be a second line of defense. It's very important that we have many ships under Indian flag, including a ship like Angria, where we could be utilized for evacuation of our expats during emergencies. Fuel cost and excise issues, we have uh, suddenly uh, the whole industry was set by fuel, heavy fuel cost by very low sulfur fuel oil. Although there is not much of a cost difference in manufacturing this, but Indian oil companies are matching their prices with foreign and trying to give that fuel in India with extra taxation, which makes the thing. So it, the, we all have to look holistically that uh, it's a nascent industry, you want it to come up, so you should not put hefty profits on an oil company which is manufactured, but they must consider a right price or a rationalized profit margin fuel to the Indian ships. Excise issues, uh, this ship doesn't have a casino. We specifically did not have casino because we wanted people to experience sea. We have seven open decks where people could enjoy. And to tell you, people never went back on our voyages into their cabins, maybe for survival, but they spend most of the time on deck getting the closeness to the sea. Uh, why I would like to say there's a second line of defense, because when we were trained in 1977-78, we were trained for Indian Navy as well as Merchant Navy. In the, one of the things which we depict here, just give me three minutes more. One of what I want to tell you is that merchant ship or a sea moves 80% of the economy. In absence of merchant ships, 50% of the world will freeze and 50% of the world will staff. This is the importance of Merchant Navy. What Merchant Navy played a role and a second line of defense is when Iran and Iraq went into war in 1980. India couldn't buy oil from either other countries, but they had no choice but to buy oil from Iran and Iraq. So we at that time took our tankers in the night, switching off radars, total radio silence, using stars to navigate to get from darkness in the morning to the port and load oil Sometimes from Iran, when Iraqis will attack you, sometimes from Iraqis will attack That is the dedication of Indian flagship. So what I would say that Indian flagship must be promoted. A very good example is 1982 Falkland War. Uh, the war for Britain took across the entire hemisphere near Argentina, where Argentina attacked Falkland. Queen Elizabeth II, which was the most prestigious ship under British flag, was stripped of a luxury and she carried 1,000 soldiers for eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball fight in Falkland. 
So that is the importance of Indian flagship. The challenges are in front of you. Uh, we have a veteran. She has been in the cruise industry more than we have been. So she will take up more on the cruise lines. Thank you very much. So let's listen to another presentation on cruise shipping. And then if need be, yeah. if there's a question or a few points. Or a